Yeah, so today from 9 to 9.30, we have a talk by Pablo Ordejón, and he did a PhD in physics in, in Madrid's Autonomous University. And then he worked as a postdoc and research and professor in Illinois and Oviedo. And then she, he moved to Barcelona. And during this time, he was one of the early developers of Siesta. And currently, he's the group leader at the Theory and Simulation Group at ICN2. So he's my group leader. And also, he acts as a director of the center. So right now, he's a very busy man. It's hard to catch him for a meeting. But when you do, he knows everything. So we, he will solve your entire thesis. So I hope you enjoy his lecture uh, on electrochemistry, on the work we have been doing on electrochem history with Transiesta. So all yours, Pablo. OK, thank you, Paul. So um, let me try to share the screen with you. Um, let's see if it works. OK, so can you see the slides? Yes. OK, okay so I'm going to give this uh, presentation on uh, using Transiesta to uh, deal with electrochemical problems. And that's a very uh, recent development, a uh, re very recent work. Actually, it's, uh, it's not published yet. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a very first step in trying to use Transiesta to describe electrochemistry problems. And what we have done so far is to address the electrified water metal interfaces uh, using Transiesta, so using the nuclear range function. So uh, as, uh, Nano, uh, as uh, Paul was saying, uh, I'm uh, the group leader at the theory simulation group at ICN2 and also the director. And I have to thank uh, Paul and Hernane very much for preparing the tutorial that you are going to be doing after the talk and for organizing all, all this all these meetings. So uh, part of this uh, work was uh, um, financed and promote, promoted by the Max Center of Excellence in Supercomputing Application, that's a, an European network in uh, of initial simulations in materials in, uh, in very large HPC infrastructures. I work at the ICN2, and uh, Hernane uh, also works at ICN2, but also at uh, RMIT, the, the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in, in Australia. So uh, the, the uh, idea of this talk or this uh, uh, work we are doing is try to understand processes that happen at the interface between liquids or electrolytes and, uh, and solids. And, uh, uh, in particular metals or semiconductors. So in cases where you have uh, some external applied voltage on your system, on your, on your electrode or your metallic lead, uh, that uh, uh, leads to some chemical reactions on the surface and charge movements, and that leads to some currents. And there's an interplay between all these three uh, factors, uh, the, the external potential, the chemical reactions, and the current. And that's in the, in the core of many, many processes that are important scientifically and technologically. So for instance, corrosion uh, has all these three ingredients, um, uh, new technologies for, uh, for energy, like water splitting uh, or uh, technology in batteries or fuel cells. Those also always involve interfaces between liquids or electrolytes and solids. And uh, all these three factors of potentials, chemical reactions and currents. And some other uh, things which are a bit far, uh, farther from uh, energy applications maybe for instance devices to measure the brain activity for instance or the neural activity so you build these electrodes which are based on transistors made of graphene but those transistors are not solid state transistors they are particular state but the the gate is a, a, is a liquid electrolyte so uh, you can measure the neural activity with this kind of devices some people in, in our institute are, are doing that and uh, this also involves this, this kind of, uh, of uh, science of, uh, of processes. So we want to understand these processes at the atomic scale, uh, both to get a deeper understanding of the science of it, but also to accelerate discovery of new materials and new devices that can take uh, a profit of these, of these uh, properties, and uh, especially in the energy applications. So to do that, you have to solve, or you have to understand what happens at the microscopic level very near the surface. And this is a typical plot of, of what is called the double layer. So you have a, 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 a solid in which you have some potential that leads to some surface charges. And in the, in the electrolyte or in the liquid, 
you may have some uh, a liquid which is uh, polar so the the molecules can polarize at the surface and form some uh, screening dipoles here but you may also have uh, ions uh, in solution which are typically solvated and these ions will source will also accumulate to screen out the charges in the metal and you form this so-called double layer but you also form this diffuse layer where uh, the solvated ions are more dispersed but there is a distribution of these solvated ions along uh, or uh, as a function of the distance to the surface and all these things happen uh, at a microscopic level actually the diffuse layer the, the double layer happens in nanometer scales the diffuse layer can happen at much longer scales micrometer maybe depending on the concentration of ions and so on but what we want to do is to understand all this from the atomistic point of view the uh, at the atomistic level you may have for instance more complex processes in which the solvated ions get very near the surface and get uh, stripped out of their solvation layer and they get attached directly to the to the uh, solid and uh, this is what is called a specific absorption and we will see some examples of that in the in the talk so these are the kinds of things we want to understand what is the structure of the double layer what chemical reactions occur in the interaction between the metal or the, the solid and the liquid and the electrolyte what are the currents both fire like so coming from chemical reactions and not fire like so just capacity or capacitance uh, uh, currents and what is the effect of course of the applied uh, uh, external potential uh, and what what is the challenge for uh, atomic simulations or for first principle simulations there are two major challenge challenges one is it has to do just with the geometry of the system of your of your problem this is a geometry which is not is not a crystal it's not periodic so you have an open system uh, in which uh, you have an infinite system with uh, open conditions so electrons can flow in and out so what you define are intensive quantities are chemical potentials and uh, temperatures and so on and not extensive quantities and that's a problem for uh, ab initio simulations uh, then you have semi-infinite electrodes. The, the electrodes are metallic leads, which are essentially bulk. They are not microscopic, and they are semi-infinite. So that's a problem also for the equations. And they are non-periodic. A crystal is also infinite, but it's periodic, so you can apply uh, block theorem, and you can solve it. In this case, uh, it's, the system is infinite, but it's non-periodic. And then there are other problems that have to do with the fact that the system is out of equilibrium. It's not a system in thermodynamic equilibrium you have a, dri a driving a force an external force which is in particular in this case is that you have two different Fermi levels you have two different chemical potentials you attach a battery to your uh, electrodes and that creates two different uh, uh, chemical potentials in the two electrodes and that's a system which is out of equilibrium and that's typically difficult uh, to describe with have an issue so the chemical potential is not unique there are reactions and there are uh, currents flowing uh, so the idea is that uh, this is the same kind of uh, problems that you have in electronic transport in, in nano devices. And uh, this is precisely what transistor is able to solve. Uh, this is precisely the same kind of, of, of problem. And uh, some uh, recently there have been uh, several uh, proposals to use the technology developed for transport in the nanoscale, for electronic transport in the nanoscale, to the problem of electrochemistry and this is the i think the first clear uh, paper that uh, proposes this uh, this approach there is a previous paper by the people in in, uh, in denmark also in the denmark university uh, that doesn't propose it so uh, explicitly but where i think the ideas are already included there uh, so this is nothing something which is not really new the idea but what i'm going to show is how to apply that in practice and how can uh, can uh, what kind of science and, and physics can you get out of it so then the idea is to use all the technology developed in transistor for the case of uh, electronic transport where you're interested actually in the electronic flow in the flow of electrons through a molecule or through a nano device so you also put two, two different chemical potential that you uh, achieve uh, connecting your electrodes to an external battery but here you're interested in the electrons flowing one, one, from one electrode to the other in the case of electrochemistry, that things are much more complicated because you have some chemical reactions on the interface between the electrolyte and the, and the electrode that gives you some currents, but the current flowing through the electrolyte is not electronic. There are no electrons flowing from one electrode to the other, uh, but it's just the, the ions. So there is, there is a ionic motion that leads to the currents, 
and there is a electronic motion that leads to uh, the chemical reactions at the interface. So this is a more complicated problem, but formally you can address it solving the electronic uh, structure uh, equations just the same way as you would use in electronic transport. It's only that here you have to take into account the dynamics of the liquid and the, and the ions and the chemical species in the, in the electrolyte. So I'm going to skip this one because this is just uh, to show how you can handle non-equilibrium problems with uh, the Green's function and the Kelvin's formalism. You have already seen that along the, the tutorial the, the, in the school. Uh, and th there is something that I wanted to mention here, which is that uh, we are doing that uh, atomistically at the domestic level. Uh, so we, we can only afford to do really small systems, systems which are nanometer scale and systems in which by construction, uh, the electrodes are really very close uh, to each other. So you can afford to have systems of about a few thousands of atoms and tons at most, and that limits the distance between the electrodes. In real electrochemical problems, uh, you have a much longer distance. The distance between the electrodes are macroscopic. So uh, there is a concern whether this kind of calculation would really represent what happens in a real electrochemical experiment where the electrodes are very far away. And uh, the, the answer to that is that, yes, these calculations are uh, meaningful, provided that the electrodes are sufficiently far away so that uh, the structure of the double layer in both, uh, in both sides is really well described. So the double layer uh, 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 screens out the field produced by the external electrodes or the metallic electrodes with a, with a, a, a decay uh, length, which is characteristic of the electrolyte the electrolyte and the solvent. Uh, so if, you, if your system is large enough so that this double layer is well reproduced, what you have in the center of your slab will be essentially the behavior of the liquid or the electrolyte in the bulk, okay? So provided that this uh, distance is, far, is lar large enough so that the, electro the, the double layer in both sides is well described, this problem, this, uh, this approach will be meaningful. I mean, it will give you uh, physics and science which is relevant for the experimental a case in which the electrodes are very far away. And that depends on the electrolyte. So if you have water, for instance, you have a very high permittivity liquid that screens out the field very efficiently. Uh, so you will need a relatively small uh, cell to, to screen out the, the field. And of course, if you have uh, contra ions uh, in solution and you have a high concentration of contra ions, uh, this double layer will be very, very uh, narrow and you will afford uh, to, to do that. If you have a liquid which is not uh, a polar, it has a low permittivity, and also uh, you have a very low concentration of ions, you may need very, very large cells to reproduce this double layer, and things will get uh, much, much worse. Okay, so this is what I'm going to show. This is the kind of system we have been playing with. We are playing with uh, uh, gold electrodes, which are very simple and very easy to, to, uh, to describe, and water. And in particular, we have been doing work with uh, pure water, but also with water uh, with some contour ions, in particular sodium and chlorine, at relatively large uh, concentrations of uh, 1.25 uh, uh, moles. And we are using a cell which is relatively small. It's only three by four in the plane of the surface. So it's 12 atoms per layer. And uh, we are using two layers in the uh, contact region on each side, and then uh, four layers uh, uh, of, uh, of of the electrode in the in the transistor setup, and then we're using about forty water molecules uh, between the two the two electrodes, which is uh, something like seventeen uh, Armstrongs between both electrodes. We are using standard DFT with the van der Waals functional. Uh, we are using just the gamma point, which is really uh, a bit too small, but uh, it gives you reasonable results. Uh, the grid is two hundred Rydbergs. And we are using a quite uh, quite nice uh, basis set uh, double sheet plus polarization. And we are doing molecular dynamics uh, runs of about four uh, picoseconds with a Bertrand thermostat to fix the temperature. In the tutorial, you're going to be doing the same system that I'm going to show in the talk. The only thing that is that we are using a much smaller basis set, just single theta, to make the calculations feasible for uh, for you to reproduce in the limited time of the tutorial and in your in your laptops. So everything will be the same as I'm showing you in the talk, just with a smaller basis set, which is not really enough. And some of the data that we'll show you in the talk will not show up uh, with this basis set, single theta. And we will also use a, a smaller 
uh, 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 real space mesh to make the calculation quicker too. Okay, so this is the first result I want to show you. This is uh, uh, the calculation when you have uh, the same system. So this is some equilibrated water uh, in the middle of, uh, of two electrodes, called electrodes. And we are doing two calculations, one with zero volts and the other one imposing a voltage of two uh, volts between both electrodes. And I'm showing you here the profile of the electrostatic potential in the system as a function of the of theta, of the uh, position along uh, the sandwich. And you can see here the oscillations of the potential within the gold electrodes uh, and the different potential that happens when you go to the water uh, layer. And that's with uh, zero voltage. So you see that the potential in the right and left electrode uh, align perfectly because there is a zero voltage imposed uh, uh, between the, 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 two, the two surfaces. Uh, the red line here shows the, the average uh, in the distance of the uh, interlayer uh, planes of gold. So this is a macroscopic average, it's a prof a, a, an average of the potential that is, is really flat we, uh, inside gold and uh, it doesn't show these atomic oscillations that you have seen the, in the black core. Now, if you do the same calculation with two volts uh, of difference imposed between the two electrodes, you see something which is very similar, but you see that there is a, uh, an offset between the potential in the left and the right electrode, which corresponds precisely to the two, two volts that we, that we are imposed. Okay? But the potential looks very, very similar. If you compute the difference between both potentials, potential of zero volts and potential of two volts, then you can actually start seeing something you see that uh, there is this drop in the potential of precisely two volts between the two electrodes. And you see that the potential drops somehow uh, along the water, uh, the water layer. If you would have a system with no water, then you would see that the drop will be linear. If you have this thing in vacuum, two electrodes in vacuum, you would see a linear drop in the potential along the vacuum, which is just what corresponds to a capacitor with vacuum in between. Here you see the oscillations because water the water molecules see the field which is uh, produced by this voltage difference and this molecule these molecules polarize the charge density of the molecules will polarize to the field and that what gives you this uh, this uh, oscillations in the potential this is what you will not see if you have a, a basic set which is single theta which is the one that you will use in the tutorial with a single theta basic set the single theta is not polarizable it cannot polarize uh, on, in the presence of an electric field you need a double seat uh, basis and polarization functions uh, to, to have uh, the molecule polarized. So you won't see these this, uh, oscillations in your, in your calculations. You will see a linear drop, which is very similar to the one in vacuum. Okay. Now, uh, you see that uh, something inter interesting here already is that this would be the drop in vacuum or with no polarization of the water molecules. But actually, uh, the water molecules do polarize, and in the center of the slab, uh, the, the effective field that you feel in the water layer is much smaller than the one that you would feel in vacuum. And that's because of the, of the charge polarization of the water molecules. So with the water molecules even not moving, just the charge density uh, of the water molecules is polarized, and that screens out very significantly the potential. That was what I, what I was mentioning before, that water is very polarizable. Uh, it has dipoles that will orient, but it, it also has a charge density that can uh, polarized in the presence of the field. So the electric field is much smaller than the one that you would expect uh, just with, 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 uh, with vacuum, okay? All right, so now uh, we can do dynamics. We can actually uh, make the atoms move both in the presence of zero volts or, a, or, a, or an external voltage of two volts. And you will have different dynamics. Then you have here, you have an electric field, which is very, very strong, actually. Uh, we, are, we are putting a two volt potential in a very, very small, uh, distance so the electric field is really huge and you can see uh, in the end of the of the simulation that in the left part the water molecules are very randomly distributed there is no clear orientation of the dipoles or each dipole is oriented in a different manner but on the right all the molecules are essentially looking upwards so all the hydrogen atoms are looking up and all the oxygen oxygen atoms are looking down and that's because of the field the oxygen atoms will move towards the positive potential and the uh, negative atoms will, uh, the, the, the hydrogen atoms will move towards, towards the negative potential, okay? Uh, so you see that the water pot, uh, layer polarizes very much in the presence of the field. 
And you can see that uh, looking at the distribution of atoms, for instance, along uh, theta, if you look at hydrogen, well, you see, uh, first of all, that this liquid is an, essentially a nano liquid. It's a confined liquid in a, in a nano space. So it's not really homogeneous. It has this very pronounced layering. You can see essentially three, five layers of water here, in both in hydrogen and in oxygen. Uh, you have a much more constant uh, distribution in the center of a slab, but it's clearly a layered uh, liquid. But when you put the potential, you see clearly that hydrogen tends to move uh, up. It moves closer to the uh, negative surface and it moves away from the positive surface. So you see this double layer, this double peak uh, structure here, and these peaks move to the right compared to the one with no voltage. And the opposite happens with oxygen. Oxygen tends to move towards the positive uh, electron. Okay, so uh, and the layering is also more pronounced in the case of two volts. Okay, you see that there is this peak in oxygen that is more pronounced than in zero volts. But the main message here is that the water molecules reorient the dipoles uh, to respond to the field, and that's very uh, it's very strong. The effect is very visible. You can also see it if you look at the distribution of angles. I'm not going to describe this into detail, but uh, the distribution of angles when there is zero voltage is essentially random. You can see this broken line is what would be ideally random distribution of, of angles in the in the water liquid, and the, the the histogram is the histogram along the MD trajectories. That's for V equals zero up, and for V equal minus two down. And you see that, for instance, this angle theta which uh, is the angle between the normal to the surface and the dipole moment of uh, the water molecules is very much uh, shifted towards small angles. So it means that uh, the water molecules will essentially align along the field, along the direction of the, of the, of the surface. Okay. Uh, I think my mic is not working. I, can you hear me? Yeah, we can yes, hear Yes, you. we are hearing. Okay, no problem. Sorry. My, my, my mic ran out of batteries, so I'm, I'm going to... But I can't hear you, no, no okay. worries. All right, so um, then let, let's, let's look at what happens with the charge density in, in a bit more detail. So I'm going to show you what happens first uh, in the interface between water and, uh, and uh, iron and uh, gold without an electric field. So this is uh, what you would get in the transistor calculation uh, with zero field in the whole system, uh, 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 water plus the, the, the gold electrodes. This is the, the charge density that you obtain. And you can analyze that comparing that charge density with the charge that you would obtain uh, with the two fragments separately. So you compute, for instance, what is the charge density of the gold electrodes without water and the water without the gold electrodes. And this is what I'm showing you in the middle uh, panel. So the black full curve is the one of gold. Uh, and the, 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 the broken line is the one with uh, just water, okay? So you see that apparently they are very, very similar. They seem identical. If you subtract them, you get the change in the charge density due, due to the interaction and the chemical interaction between water and gold, which is this low, uh, low uh, figure, okay? You see that the scale here is much, much smaller than here. So the change in the charge density of water and gold when they get, get together is very small. But it's very, it's very important. So you see that there is some uh, transfer of charge, some missing charge in the surface of gold, and some extra charge in the uh, first layer of water. So there is a small charge transfer between gold and water in this particular system. And that's just the, the chemistry of this, of, this, uh, of this system, okay? You can quantify these charges. You can, for instance, compute the Mulliken charges uh, on, on each of the atoms. And I'm showing you the charges as a function of time during the simulation. Uh, this uh, orange one is the, is the charge on the gold electrodes, on both electrodes, actually, uh, added up. And the, the red one is the, is the charge on, on water. And of course, the system is neutral. Uh, so the charge uh, in gold and water cancel uh, each other perfectly. They are just mirrors, uh, one of each other. And you see that the charge, uh, the Mulliken charge, the transfer of charge is relatively small. It's only 0.2, but there are many atoms here. So it's a really quite, quite small charge. Uh, so there is not a strong link, a strong bond between both, uh, between both systems. It's just a very small charge transfer. Something what, that was not really so much expected is the fact that there is a significant charge transfer between both electrode uh, layers, between both gold uh, electrodes. And this is what I'm showing you here. 
the one uh, on the left with orange is just the sum of all the charges in all the atoms in both electrodes. But here on the right, I'm showing you the charge on each electrode separately. The one, uh, the, the brown one is on the top electrode, the, or the right electrode here, and the yellow one is the one uh, in the other electrode, the left electrode. And you see that the charges here are much, uh, much larger than the charge, uh, the total charge in gold, and they mirror each other. So when one electrode gets a positive charge, the other electrode is, is, is losing uh, an equivalent charge. So the average of these two is what I'm showing you in the left, but both electrodes are, have a very, very different charge and actually much, much larger than the charge uh, in the total electrode. And that was a bit um, surprising for us. We didn't expect that. But when, when you think about it, it's easy to understand why this happens. And the reason why this happens is the following. So you have uh, two electrodes in, and in, in the middle you have water and this water is moving. So you are doing the mix of the water and the water is moving with time. And what happens is that instantaneously, this water layer may have a dipole because instantaneously the dipoles of, the, of each water molecule may be adding up in the same direction. And you may have an instantaneous dipole which can be quite large actually, okay? And uh, if you look at the, uh, at the charges in the electrodes, this is just the difference between the charge in the top and the bottom electrode and you correlate that with the dipole of the water layer in between, you see that they perfectly follow each other. When the dipole is large, the charge transfer is also large. When the dipole is small, the charge transfer is also small. And what is happening here is that if you have a structure in which you have a very large dipole in the water layer in, 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 in between the two electrodes, the electrodes are metallic, of course, and that will generate surface charges in the electrodes to screen out the dipole of the water layer. So if you have a negative, uh, uh, a dipole like this with negative on the left and positive on the right, you will generate charges in the left electrode which are positive and in the right electrode which are negative. That will screen out the dipole of water. And this is what takes, uh, makes this uh, charge transfer between the left and the right electrode. Is a charge transfer which is needed to compensate completely the dipole created by the water layer. And that's why you see this correlation between dipole and the charge in the, between the electrodes. And that's very important. I, we didn't expect these this, uh, oscillations of dipoles and oscillations of, um, of charges to be so large as they really are, okay? Okay, so let me go to the other aspect of, of the calculations, which is what happens when you put a potential and I'm going to show you uh, the results when you don't have any water. So this is just a capacitor with vacuum in between. You have the system, uh, the solution with uh, a, a, an external voltage, and you compare that with the solution with a zero voltage. And when you have, if you compare the density of these two systems, it's just that the charges in the metal uh, accumulate on the surface uh, layer of the metal, uh, and you have a negative charge in one uh, uh, surface and a positive charge in the other, and that uh, makes the, the field to be completely flat inside the, the electrode and makes the, the potential drop linearly in the vacuum region. This is the standard behavior of, um, of a capacitor, right? What happens if you have water? If you have water, we, ha we have the same thing, just with water in between, and you can do the same calculation. You can compute the charge when you imp impose the voltage and compare it to the charge with zero voltage. And I'm doing this at the same geometry. So the water layer has the same geometry in both calculations, right? I'm just changing the potential. And what you see is something which is very, very similar in the, uh, in the electrodes, in the surface. You see that the, there is a peak, which is almost exactly the same as the one when there was no water in the left electrode, the same peak in the right electrode. And then you have, of course, some oscillations again, because water is polarizing. You have a field and the field polarizes the molecules and that creates some uh, oscillations in the charge density in the layer. But the screening charges that you have in the metallic uh, surfaces are just the same as you would have in a capacitor with no water, okay? And this is just a Poisson's equation. You, you need the same charges to screen out the same potential in the same, uh, if you have the same geometry, okay? Now, uh, it's important that to see that this is just uh, with using a fixed geometry, okay? Now, uh, again, uh, when you have a system like, uh, like, like this one and, and the atoms are moving. I was showing you before that uh, there is a dipole which is forming. And the point now is that the dipole will, will be different depending on the external field, okay? 
if you have a sternal field, you have a potential like this, which is very large, the water layer, the water molecules will orient themselves along the, the field and they will create a dipole which is different from the dipole that you would have at zero volts. And actually this dipole will be very large. So for instance, I'm showing you here the dipole that will happen in the water layer when you impose a voltage of two volts. And it's a huge uh, uh, dipole and it creates a huge uh, electric field inside the water. It creates a very large depolarizing field. And of course, this field will be uh, screened out by the metallic leads. Okay, again, the metallic leads are, are metallic and they will screen out all the external potentials. Okay, so uh, I'm showing you here the same system as before, but now I'm comparing different things. I'm comparing on the bottom the situation that you have in the whole system with the potential, but then I'm comparing that with the charge that you would have in gold and in water separately. So here, somehow, I'm also including the field that you need to polarize the water, okay? Before I was showing you just the field that you need to impose the voltage, which is just the same as, as the one that you need uh, in the vacuum. But here I'm showing you the field that you need to impose the voltage and to impose and to, to screen out the, the, the polarization of the, of the water molecules. And you see that the, the, the charges in the surface are much bigger now. Uh, than before. Before it was this small peak here, and now it's this huge peak. So you need an extra fill, an extra charge to compensate for the dipole that you are creating in the water uh, uh, layer. Okay? And that's just uh, the physics of a capacitor. If you have a capacitor with a, a dielectric constant or a permittivity which is high, you need more charges on the surface to screen out the potential and to, uh, to create this, this voltage difference compared to the one that you would have in vacuum. And actually that gives you a way to compute the permittivity of your liquid. Oh, sorry. Uh, something is popping up here. Okay. Um, so if you look at the capacitance of a, com uh, a capacitor, uh, you know that that depends on the dielectric uh, constant. And by comparing the charges in the capacitor with no water and the capacitance of the uh, and the charges of the capacitor with water, you could get an estimate of the dielectric constant of, of your water layer. Um, uh, we, we've done that in this case, and we obtain for two volts, we obtain a, a, a dielectric constant or a permittivity, which is about eight. Um, there are two things here. One is that two volts is probably too large. It's saturating the polarizability of water and it gives you a dielectric constant which is too small uh, because you are all the dipoles are essentially uh, aligned along the field and you can no longer uh, polarize anymore the, the system. So it's a, it's a lower estimate of, uh, of epsilon. Actually, if you do the calculation with a much smaller field, about 10 times smaller, you get a, a permittivity which is quite, quite high, it's about 13, okay? Now, the second thing is that this number is very far from the uh, permittivity of bulk water, which is about 80. But actually, we're not computing bulk water. We are computing an, a, a water of layer, which is nanometer size, confined between a, in a nanometer uh, slit. And actually, there are some recent experiments by the group of uh, um, Game in Manchester, where they experimentally uh, find what is the uh, dielectric constant of water as a function of the, of the, of the thickness of the layer in nano-confined water. And for distances of about uh, 17 Armstrongs, which is what we are using, they found a electric constant of about 20, which is not so far from the one we are obtaining of, of, of 13. Okay, so we are obtaining numbers which are very, very close to, to the experimental estimates of, uh, of the group of, uh, of uh, Andrew Gain. Okay, another way to compute the, the permittivity would be not to compute the charges like we did here. These are Mulliken charges that we use but would be to compute the dipole, for instance. With the dipole, you can also compute the permittivity. And uh, we've done that as a function of the voltage uh, uh, imposed. You see that for small voltage, voltages, the dipole uh, scales linearly with the voltage, which is what you would expect in linear response. And that would give you a permittivity, which is about uh, 13, 12, and so on. Um, but then when you have a, a larger voltage, again, the molecules are saturated, the polarization is saturated. So uh, this dipole moment saturates and bends uh, and is, is not non-linear non any longer. So you can compute the, the, the dielectric constant from that. And we obtain again numbers which are uh, very similar to the ones we were obtaining. And this decrease of the dielectric constant with uh, very large voltages. The error bars here, uh, 
are not really error bars, are the, the width of your distribution. So you don't have a, a single dipole here. If you put a voltage, uh, the dipole uh, uh, changes with time during the simulation time, and you have a distribution of dipoles, which has this typical width. This is the standard deviation of the distribution of the uh, dipoles that you would have in your calculation. So you have a width of the uh, dielectric constant, which is uh, uh, the one which is shown with the, with the bars. OK, so just to finish uh, the presentation, getting too long, um, just wanted to show you some cases in which we actually have an electrolyte when you have some um, uh, counter ions which are uh, in solution. And we started with uh, chlorine, and I'm just showing you some molecular dynamics, again, with zero volts and with minus two volts. With zero volts, what happens here is what I was showing you in, the, in one of the first slides, that the chlorine atom gets attached chemically to the surface and that's what is called selective uh, absorption. When you put a negative voltage, chlorine is a positive, is a negative ion, it's, a, it's a, an ion, uh, and so it's get, it gets repelled from the negative surface and gets uh, uh, attracted by a positive one, so it shifts uh, towards the negative one. So you can see that here, the, the position of the ion as a function of time in the negative voltage, it, there is a drift of the ion uh, towards the positive electrode. It's very, it's very uh, slow because the, the diffusivity of the ions is very slow, but uh, in, in this typical of time of uh, a few picoseconds, you can actually, you can actually see it. Uh, this one is uh, the same thing, but just with two counter ions, with sodium and with chlorine. And again, here, uh, if you don't put any voltage, uh, chlorine is not essentially not moving, but uh, sodium will quickly attach to one of the surfaces, to the near surface. Uh, when you put a voltage of plus one, then uh, chlorine gets uh, attracted by the positive uh, electrode and uh, sodium gets attracted by the negative. So they drift. And you see that there are different drift uh, velocities for both uh, ions. And that, that's quite um, co uh, consistent with experiments. In experiments, the chlorine atoms in water or ions in water uh, have a higher diffusivity than, than sodium. So we are getting something which is, uh, it correlates uh, well with the, with the experiment. One thing which is interesting is that the fact that you see that in this case in sodium, sodium gets attached very quickly to the surface. And uh, there is some chemistry going on there. If you look at the Mulliken charges of the two ions for chlorine, which stays away from the surface, the, 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 the Mulliken charge is very close to minus one to the net, uh, nominative uh, 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 anion uh, charge. Uh, sodium, when it's Far from the surface is about a, a, a charge of 0.75, which is close to one. But when it gets uh, in contact with the surface, there is a very uh, large change in the in the charge because there is a chemical bond uh, between sodium and the and the metallic uh, electrode. So the sodium essentially loses the positive charge. Okay, uh, with plus two uh, with plus one volts, since both atoms or both uh, an ion, uh, ions are very far from the surface, they are never in contact with the surface, the charges are essentially constant. So they are ions which are moving uh, in the solution. Okay, and with this I will finish. Uh, summary is that, um, uh, well, I think uh, it's, it's clear that uh, non-equilibrium bridge function techniques are uh, really a viable methodology to study uh, electrified metallic and electrolyte interfaces from first principles. It's expensive, but it's feasible. Uh, all these calculations that we're showing uh, were done uh, in uh, in about uh, from 100 to 200 processors, and uh, essentially they took about one minute of 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 of, uh, of real time of wall time per molecular dynamics time step. So simulations of a few pico picoseconds would only take a few two, three, uh, four, four days. Okay, so this is really something which is feasible. Uh, the external potential is explicitly imposed and as an intensive quantity, which is what you need to correlate with experiments. Uh, I've, I've shown you molecular dynamic simulations for water, both pure and uh, containing ions. And uh, one important message is that water is really very, very well able, able to screen out the electrode uh, potential very efficiently by polarization. And that polarization comes from both from the molecular polarizability, the distortion of the electronic charge, as a, as a response to the electric field, and also from the re reorientation of the ions of the of the of the of the dipoles of the of the molecules, and this is a very very strong uh, effect. And I've shown you that the dipole moments uh, it shows a very large fluctuation. The dipoles are fluctuating very very much 
uh, by a large amount on a picosecond uh, time scale. And uh, you can use the simulations, for instance, to estimate the permittivity of water, uh, which in our case compares quite favorably uh, with the experiment. And uh, I've shown you that ion solution show the expected behavior. And they also hint to the viability of addressing chemical reactions. I've shown you that when the, 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 the ions get in contact with the surface, there is a chemical reaction, there is a change in the, in the, in the charge uh, of, of, the, of the ions. And that uh, can serve as a proof that uh, if you have some chemical reactions of some chemicals in the solution, that uh, will be able to, to be stimulated by this kind of, uh, of approaches. This is something that we have not finished yet, but we are working on that to really st study chemical reactions and real electrochemistry uh, with this kind of approach. And with this, I finish. Just to acknowledge uh, the group. These are the people who have been mainly involved uh, in this work uh, during time. Uh, Hernane has um, uh, become uh, 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 connected to this project uh, more recently, but he has been uh, very, uh, uh, very useful for for, for us in, in 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 putting this to to work. And uh, again, I thank him very much for uh, helping me to organize this tutorial. Uh, Nick, for me, Nick, of course, uh, he was very instrumental in having all this running with uh, Transiesta. Alberto Garcia from uh, from IGMAP, uh, also to, to have Transiesta ready to do these calculations. And Marie Fernandez Serra, who was one of the people that originally uh, made the proposal of using Transiesta to study electrochemistry, and which is also very uh, a very strong collaborator in this in this in this work. I would like to say that uh, our work is, is, is hiring now. We are looking for uh, postdocs to do both uh, development of SIESTA and applications, and in particular also applications in electrochemistry. And uh, just the last slide, funding, very important. So uh, essentially, especially the MAX uh, uh, Center of Excellence, the supercomputing resources uh, in the Spanish network of supercomputing, the ministry, and the patrons of ICN2. And with this, I will finish, and uh, I'll be happy to make to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much for the talk, Pablo. So there are two questions here. So you want me to read it or you want to read by yourself? Uh, if you can read them for me. Uh, okay, so okay. So the first question is from- uh, Questions and answers, right? Yes. Okay. We, we read it? Yeah, yeah, I have it in screen. Okay, right? okay. Okay, so uh, if we do the battery charge analysis, the main conclusion is the same. From my personal experience, the Mulliken charges are not that trustable. Okay, so that's right. The numbers for Mulliken charges are, are not very uh, accurate and are not very trustable in, in the sense of, of, of the numerical values. Uh, if you use other schemes to compute the charges, you, you get different numbers. We have not computed battery charges, but we have computed uh, Voronoi, and Hirschfeld uh, charges. The numbers are different, but the trends are the same. So when you change the potential or when you do the dynamics, the evolution of the charges is the same as the one that you find in, in Mulliken. So that's right, the numbers are not uh, solid. Mulliken charges are not physical observables, so it's not something that you can correlate directly with the experiment, but they give you a hint of what happens. But in any case, you can compute other kinds of, of, of charges and that will give you the same physical message. Uh, okay, so the question, uh, using all this job, would it be possible to implement it to simulate a trans transmission function along a single molecule that is electrochemical oxidized, reduced in an electrolyte environment? Okay, so this is what I was trying to say in one of the first slides, but probably it was too quick, my comment. My comment is that with Transiesta, the currents that you compute are the, the electronic currents from one electrode to the other, are ballistic currents going, electrons flowing through the whole system from one electrode to the other. In the electrochemistry case, that doesn't happen. There, is, there are no electrons flowing from one electrode to the other. So if you would compute the transiesta current, that, you, that would give you zero. You have currents because you have chemical reactions in which electrons are transferred from the molecule to the electrode or vice versa. That's an instantaneous current between the molecule and the electrode. And then you, you have an observable macroscopic current because there are there is transport of charge through the molecules or through the ions uh, 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 along the solution, the, the, the solvent. 
it's not electrons that travel uh, the whole way, okay? So to compute the currents, you would have to do molecular dynamics or some other uh, 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 way of computing ionic currents, not electronic currents, okay? So there, are, there is a charge transfer, transport by electrons during the chemical reaction, but the actual current that you measure is due to the electrolyte, it's not electronic. So if you would compute the, the transiesta uh, uh, um, um, transmission or the current, you would get something which is zero or very, very small, okay? So uh, this is not physically what the process that you have to, to compute. Okay, so another question, as we know is in experiments, the reactions are happening in solvent environment. Here in computation, you have this system, electrode, uh, water, electrode. Could be more realistic if you consider the effect of solvent by some approximations such as the electric constant, etc. Okay, so absolutely yes. Uh, uh, you, could, you don't need to have quantum water to do this. You could have classical water and Hernane is, is, is the one working on that. He's, uh, doing these calculations now with uh, classical water. You could also uh, have a, a continuous model for water that would be uh, quite quite feasible and quite uh, quite um, appropriate. You would, in, in a continuous model, you would probably lose all these uh, effects due to the, to the change in the dipoles, the dynamic change in the dipoles, which may be important. Uh, and you would, of course, lose if there is, if water is anyhow contributing to the chemistry to the chemical reactions. Maybe in some cases, water really needs to interact chemically. And in that case, uh, that would, wouldn't give you the, the right answer. But in principle, yes, you can remove most of the complexity of the liquid just by using something more, more classical and, and not, not fully quantum. Okay, so that's, do you have for postdoc to develop excitons? No, okay, so excitons, um, you don't have excitons in siesta. Excitons are an excited state where you need to take into account the interaction between the the, the electron and the and the and the hole, and uh, we cannot do it directly in siesta. Maybe in some other approaches like TDDFT uh, that could be done, but not not in siesta or, or in transiesta. As as far as I know, maybe Thomas has some more insight on on, on this. Um, Okay, so I'm not an expert in specific, uh, in specific absorption, but could you tell me if this absorption is stable? In general, after the potential is removed, the atoms are dissolved or are they staying there? Okay, so what we found uh, for, for this particular electrolyte, which is a, a sodium and chlorine, we found this absorption even at zero volts. Okay, so it seems to be quite stable, at, at least with, uh, in the absence of potential. I'm sure that if you would put the opposite potential, you would drive the, the, the ions to, to, to be detached from the surface. But so far, we haven't seen that, uh, um, uh, that that's driven by the, by the external potential in this particular case. But that's, of course, depending on the molecule and the, and the solvent that you have. Uh, that's that very much system dependent. There will be many systems in which the, the absorption is driven by the potential, actually. And it may happen in some potentials and not in, in, in some others. Okay, so with this methodology, uh, has been applied to chemical reactions? No, that what, that's what I'm saying, that uh, we have not yet done chemical reactions. I think the only kind of chemical reactions in this, is this one I showed about the, uh, the specific absorption of the ions in, in the, on, the, on the electrodes, but not, that's not uh, really a chemical reaction. That's just more absorption, but we are working on it. I think, I think it will be feasible. Um, you may have the problem of uh, having a chemical reaction in which the barrier is high, so it's an unlikely event, it's a, it's a rare event, and you won't be able to observe it through a... Um, standard molecular dynamics. You will have to, to have some kind of advanced molecular dynamics, uh, steel molecular dynamics, or uh, doing some kind of uh, infrequent, infrequent events, like Parinello is doing so on, uh, because the time otherwise should be too large. But I think the physics is right. So you, you may be able to drive these uh, reactions using these, these simulations. Okay, so the last question, are you using peridipondary conditions? I'm using the standard transiesta machinery, so uh, uh, in transiesta, there is one, everything is done without boundary conditions. So you have the, the semi-infinite electrodes, you have the Green's functions, the, the self-energies that connect to your system. 
you solve a finite part of the system, but you solve it with open boundary conditions. It's not periodic. There is only one part if we, in which we use periodic boundary conditions, which is the solution of the Poisson equation. Okay, there you use periodic boundary conditions just by convenience, but uh, it's not really a periodic model. You are, you are solving the model, uh, which is a finite system, is, the, is your contact region and part of the electrodes connected to semi-infinite uh, electrodes. So it's not really a periodic model. Okay. okay, another question is, is the model able to predict practical Partial, uh, no, pr particle, particle. I don't know what particle means. Charge transfer between ions. Maybe it is partial. Mm, is it partial? Partial, partial, partial. Yeah. So partial is what we find. Okay. So if there is a chemical absorption of the molecules or the the electrolyte on the electrode, there is also there is always a partial charge. There is never a, a total charge transfer. So so yes, absolutely yes. Uh, Actually, the, if you look at the Mulliken charges, even if the, uh, uh, if the ion is very far from the surface, so you would expect a full charge on the, on the ion, the Mulliken charges that do not give you a full charge because you always have some overlap with the, with the environment molecules. And even if you have a full uh, charge uh, in the ion, that, that net charge would somehow distribute also along the water molecule. So you never find a full, uh, entire uh, integer charge, let's say. But when the molecule is absorbed, there is also always a partial charge. There is a, a chemical bond and the electrons are distributed um, uh, according to the polarization um, in, on, the, on the molecule and the interface and the, the surface. So there is always a par partial charge, yes. Okay, so I don't see any so other questions. Now I think that there is one question from one of the panelists. Yeah, very nice talk, uh, Pablo. Thanks. Yeah, I could not. I could not ask in the questions and answers. Um, so, uh, did you consider the role of, of temperature, and, and what happens when you change the temperature? The temperature. You mean the the, the ionic temperature or the electronic temperature? No, we we were just doing simulations at three hundred Kelvin at the room temperature. We didn't change that. Okay. Um, we are using a, a, a simple um, thermostat, but I, I wouldn't see any problem with that. Also, I was thinking about this, uh, the, the quantum nuclear motion. I think you, 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 you mentioned about it uh, when I was writing, so I, I, I didn't get it. What is, uh... Uh, no, I didn't mention quantum motion. Uh, of course, quantum motion can be important in water. And... Um, and we, we, we completely, completely miss that in these kinds of simulations. I don't see any essential problem in, in linking this with quantum uh, path integral uh, things like uh, to, to, to obtain the quantum motion of, of the ions. It would be much, much more expensive, of course. But yes, water may, you may have some effects in which quantum um, effects would be very important. And uh, people are starting to see what happens uh, not only in water, which is now relatively well understood, but also with uh, with solvents. When you have solvents in water, what are the effects of quantum motion? They sometimes they are very important. Yes. So we are not doing that. We are still very far from that. But in principle, if you would have a large enough machine, I think yeah. you would be able to to do it. Yes. No, but it could also be that when you look at the difference between zero bias and finite bias, uh, the effects of quantum motion is not so important, or maybe even the effects of, of temperature. I don't know if you, if you thought about this. Uh, no, I haven't thought about this, no. Um, when you put the voltage, everything is very much constrained, let's say. Uh, water is not so free to move. Uh, and um, so for instance, th this, th that did, I didn't uh, comment on that. The, um, the oscillation or the fluctuations in the dipoles is much, much smaller when you have a field. It decreases very much because water molecules are forced to be in a given direction. And that may also help in removing, in removing the, the quantum effects. Right. You have a very flat surface. Of course, quantum effects can be very strong. And the, the wave function can be very delocalized. If you have a potential that constrains your system, then it's, it's much more classical, let's say. Right, right. So yeah, I didn't think about that, yeah. 
Okay, Nor. So some other question. Mm -hmm. 